I'm going to be doing some reading today that won't be on the screen. The verses will be there, so if you would like to follow along, have your Bibles open and ready, that's great. Um, in times past, I remember that there were pages that were turning in the audience, and that doesn't quite happen so much anymore, but those pauses will happen in this one as I try to uh, navigate this technology up here. So, uh, As you can see on the screen, the title today is Seeing the Truth. I uh, struggled a little bit with the title of this uh, topic because I had a different uh, idea based on the content, and maybe it'll come out at the end as we go along. Um, but uh, I settled on this one uh, because of where I want to take this message this morning. So <clears throat> we want to start out in Matthew 6, 22 and 23. And here we see on the screen, it says, The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. So as we contemplate this topic today of seeing the truth, we can correlate here this message from Christ uh, saying the eye is the lamp of the body. What we see, what we perceive is what we take in. And it's very important that our eye is good, that it can perceive things the way that God wants us to see things. It states here, if your eye is healthy, that leaves me with the impression that it's something we have to work at, we have to exercise. If that is healthy, your whole body will be full of the light. But if your eye is bad, or if we don't correct what we see, if we don't look at things the right way, that will lead to darkness in our life. And I think we can see the message here is that the light brings hope, that it brings a message of a better life, something that pushes back the darkness. If any of you have stumbled around in the dark, it's never fun, is it? It's a difficult thing to, to be in. Uh, at night, I'll get up, use the restroom, and I try not to turn on all lights. Fortunately, I've done it so many times, I kind of know where I'm going, but occasionally it's the, uh, oh, I stubbed my toe on it on the door or on the cabinet. And so we, we have light so we can see, and here we can understand that this light that God is providing, we need to understand it and bring it into us. In 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 6, turn there. And I am reading out of the ESV today. Therefore, verse 1 of chapter 4 in 2 Corinthians, Therefore I have this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. A lot of information in here, but the idea that if we put the knowledge of God in our hearts, that will remove the blindness that comes, this darkness that happens the God of this world is opposed to this message and opposed to this light. His purpose is to continue to cause this darkness, this veiling. And as we work our Christian walk and we come across those that are really literally stumbling in this spiritual kind of darkness that's going on by the God of this world, there is an opportunity there, right, to speak and say the things that are true 
to shed a little light on this confusion. I had an opportunity to speak to my neighbor literally yesterday. And this is a young man that's grown up Jehovah Witness and um, has had a lot of challenges in his upbringing and some of the things that had happened to him. And he's in a, a real interesting spot as he's questioning things. And it's quite fascinating to remember how important the light that God has given us, this information, this knowledge, how beneficial it is and hopeful. Be able to share that with someone brings out a lot of joy and you want to help so desperately. The key really is to not get overexcited, to recognize that everything takes its course. And the hope is, is that little messages and seeds and things that have been said will bring more discussion. But God says in verse 6, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And that did come up a little bit in the adult class this morning. This idea that the message that God gave, this hope through His Son, through His death, burial, and resurrection, is that light that came into this world. Now, I want us to look at this just as a simple statement out of this reading. The God of this world equals blinding. This is what Satan is about, is to bring us or keep us in this darkness, this, this place where we can't see, where we can't do the right thing. So it's always there. It's pervasive. The darkness is around us. Our purpose in trying to speak this is to help enlighten, to bring truth. And then we can see that in this text, God equals, and this is not an all-encompassing statement, uh, accompanying statement, but God equals giving light through His Son, Jesus, His anointed. And this message that we have seen throughout the Old and New Testament bears truth. What Jesus brought to this world and the way He conducted Himself and the way He interacted with His own brothers and sisters of His native country, and of course, speaking to the whole world, was to try to push back this darkness, this blindness that's coming through the God of this world. Jeremiah 5, 19 through 29. And when your people say, why has the Lord our God done all these things to us? You shall say to them, as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve foreigners in a land that is not yours. Declare this in the house of Jacob, proclaim it in Judah. Hear this, O foolish and senseless people who have eyes but see not, who have ears but hear not. Do you not fear me? declares the Lord. Do you not tremble before me? I placed the sand as the boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier that it cannot pass. Though the waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over it. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and gone away. They do not say in their hearts, let us fear the Lord our God who gives the rain in its season, the autumn rain, and the spring rain and keeps for us the weeks appointed for the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these away and your sins have kept good from you. For wicked men are found among my people. They lurk like fowlers lying in wait. They set a trap, they catch men. Like a cage full of birds, their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and rich. They have grown fat and sleek. They know no bounds in deeds of evil. They judge not with justice, the cause of the fatherless to make it prosper, and they do not defend the rights of the needy. Shall I not punish them for these things, declares the Lord, and shall I not avenge myself on a nation, nation such as this? This slide says traps and snares. What was going on with God's people was that they were moving away from Him. They were following for other gods, other nations and what they believed, and they weren't staying true to the Lord their God. And the messaging that he had given them was so specific 
the, the laws that he gave on how they were to conduct themselves and to speak to those nations as an example of God's people. But here we see in verse 21, hear this, O foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but see not. They did know who God was, but they weren't perceiving it and keeping it in a way that kept them on the path. Who have ears but hear not. They could hear that message, they could see it being repeated in their rites and rituals, in their customs, in their very existence as a kingdom. But yet it wasn't affecting their heart. And this really speaks back to that opening sli slide. This idea of letting the light in is to change our heart. It's to push away the darkness that we know is there and bring God's truth in. I place the sand as the boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier that it cannot pass. Though the waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. We have to be careful and understand when God makes these statements of truth that we bring them in and apply them properly in our lives. There are traps and snares and things that are happening that if we aren't careful, just like God's chosen people, we can fall for. In Romans chapter 11, 7 through 10, Paul writes to this, What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. The whole challenge of mankind is to try and find God, but there is so many other messages, so many other pieces of information that are given and distractions, traps and snares. And it was happening to God's very own chosen people. And here we see that it's being dealt with with the apostles. And Paul here is writing about it, looking at his brothers and sisters in faith and recognizing that they're hardened. They're not looking and seeking that truth. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26, Paul writes here to Timothy, And the Lord's servant must not strive, but be gentle to all, apt to teach, forbearing, in meekness, correcting them that oppose themselves. If peradventure God may give them repentance unto the knowledge of truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Great advice for all of us that are trying to keep God in the forefront of our minds. There's actionable items here. The Lord's servant's servant must not strive, but be gentle to all, apt to teach, forbearing, in meekness correcting them that oppose themselves. This takes some courage, right? When you're speaking to people and they're telling you things and you're trying to understand exactly what they're saying, right? They're, okay, there's this kind of over-encompassing statement, you know, I mean, uh, you know, God is good and I depend on Him. And then you start trying to inject something, okay, so how does that work with this scripture? How do you apply this? And, and maybe there's other things that are said in the conversation, and then you, you try to inject some things that would help bring more light to that discussion. But it, it's a tricky challenge because you want to have that open mind at that moment, but it can be closed. The blindness can hit so quickly. But we are called to say the things that are true and to take that opportunity, but doing it here with what? Gentleness. Meekness. These are critical attitudes to have when we speak to people. And to share this knowledge takes that uh, environment so that they can hear it. And that's the advice given here. Luke 6, 39 through 42. 
says uh, here, he also told them a parable. We spoke about parables a little bit this morning. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. This text here is extremely important because it tells us we have to make corrections in ourselves. We have to make sure that we're handling the truth in a way that brings glory to God. To push back this darkness takes a lot of effort and it's not to be taken lightly. But the advice and the admonition here is a disciple is not above his teacher, but when he continues to follow that, will become like the teacher. And really, that's the purpose of God's messaging throughout all of mankind. Come to know me, speak the truth, and you will find this light. You will push back this darkness. Now, later on, he talks about the speck and the log and the responsibility that each of us has to take upon ourselves to make the corrections that we see as uh, described here in the laws and in the teachings of Christ. Matthew 23, 24 through 26 states, You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. A lot of times we'll read this and go, wow, that was really bold and very direct. But remember, these were the leaders of Israel. These were the ones that were supposed to bring the light to themselves and to the world. And it was not happening. And Jesus was being very clear, you are blind guides. Because they would tell you all the things that God would ask, but what would they do? None of them. They would say one thing and do another. That's why we see the word hypocrites here. This ap approach isn't necessarily for all of us, but it does point out the importance of speaking the truth. And in this particular case, this example, because of Jesus dealing with the leaders of, of his people and the, the things that they were doing wrong, he had to be very direct with them but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Those things are in all of us. We have to, again, go back to that opening text, the eye is the lamp of the body. We need to bring the light in and push that darkness back. Darkness is dealing with this description of greed and indulgence. These aren't humble, right, and willing to help type attitudes. Greed and self-indulgence is me, me, me. And here we can see that that has to be changed. Otherwise, we're blind guides. We can tell people, this is how you're supposed to behave. This is how you're supposed to act. But if we aren't doing that ourselves, it's not going to bring the light and push back the darkness. James 1, 14 through 22. Here you see it reads in uh, verse 14 of James 1, but each person, person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Understand the condition we're in. This is our humanity, right? We are naturally wired to do these things that are spoken of in verses 14 and 15. Don't be deceived. Acknowledge and take action. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, 
It's not from the President of the United States. It's not from the community. All of these things that are perfect and good are coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Self-deception is a very prevalent problem. We hear a lot of things happening in this world. They call it misinformation. They call it whatever. It's all deception when it doesn't speak to the truth of what God intends to do. The God of this world is about pervasive darkness, confusion, to make it hard. And it's up to each of us to bring that light into our lives and exemplify that. And if we can remember where that comes from, it comes from God. He's the Father of lights. It's Him that brings that light into this world. All of us have the challenge. All of us have the potential for the sin and the things that happen to us that are natural. We, we can overcome that if we can make this change by exercising our understanding and remembering what God has said. Keep this light in your heart. Keep this truth in the ways that we think, in the ways that we do things. This will be this first fruits of his creatures. This effort that we make really stands out to the world. It's what happens when the light is shown in a very dark space, right? It's actually quite a bit brighter. And a lot of times it hurts people's eyes and they don't want to look at it. But we have to understand that God's truth pushes back on this darkness. It's very important. Further on in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, lest you be wise in your own sight. We spoke about this this morning, right? The idea that we can reason in ourselves and say, oh, I know what's right. I know what... We have to reason, but the reasoning is centered around God and what He is saying, not what we're saying. Lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. This changing of the law, changing the way that mankind came to God from having to become part of the nation of Israel to the church age really is speaking to this fullness of the Gentiles. God opens up changes the way things work so that mankind can look at the way he is bringing about his kingdom to the whole world. When Jesus came on the scene, Rome was in charge, things were in disarray. The nation of Israel, as he spoke to it earlier, there were Pharisees and Sadducees trying to keep things going, but they were way off the mark. They hadn't done what God had told them. Once Jesus spoke about the new covenant and he got his apostles marching out and spreading the gospel, these things changed. We're grateful for this because it's very difficult to keep keeping sacrifices and the things that were set up by the nation of Israel. But here we see that we have to carry God's message on without those things. In our heart, seeking these truths. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And cast out demons in your name? And do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Do we say, Lord, Lord? Yes, we do, don't we? That is our acknowledgement of his power and his authority. So who does this apply to? potentially to me and every one of us sitting here. 
it's incumbent upon us to continue to bring God's truth into our light, into our hearts and to carry this message on. Not to be overconfident in the sense of wisdom and our own thinking, but remembering the proper order of how God has set things up. We hear a lot of things being said today about what is going to happen, how things are going to work out. There's an election coming up here in two weeks. Promises are being made, things are being said. And unfortunately, many, many people are following the blind. And it's a difficult thing to see, but it is the reality that we're in. So all the more that we want to hang on to these truths and recognize where we fit in God's plans. I don't want to be at that judgment and hear these words, I never knew you. Puts a real important aspect of keeping our eyes, keeping our vision, keeping clarity on what God is doing. Luke 4, 17 through 19. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus had a very specific role to bring this messaging to the world. And it is for all of these people that hear this message. Good news to the poor. Well, all of us are poor. Okay, maybe, maybe some of us have more money than others, but we're talking about poor in spirit. All of us lack the things that we need for salvation. This is good news because he's bringing a message of hope. Set at liberty to the captives. Recovering the sight to the blind. We spoke about that earlier. People are stumbling around. We stumble around at times. But the light brings clarity. Jesus understood this and he carried it out to his death. And we spoke about that this morning and how important that was. So... How important it is for us to heal our eyes, to kind of keep things in perspective. Revelation 3, 17 through 18 says, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. This is the message to the church given to the folks here, explaining to them that you think you're all that. But he's pointing out that you're not there you're not realizing the shape and the condition you're in. The admonition here is to buy from me gold refined by fire. Gold is a precious thing. The truth is a precious thing. We're, re we're speaking about what God intends to do and here it says that there will be white garments given to remove that shame, that nakedness, and salve to anoint our eyes. The truth gives us these hopes, these understandings of what God intends to do and to take us away from this situation. This message was given so that people can understand you can think you're all that, and you've got everything working, but we always need to remember where the truth is. It resides with God. So how do we see through this darkness? How do we get through it? Proverbs 4, 
18 and 19. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. And this just speaks exactly what we were talking about earlier. We have an opportunity to take the light that God has given, if we keep it in us, and then we shine it back out, reflect that back out, it can give people a chance to see where they're stumbling. We need that for ourselves, and hopefully we can help others so that they can find this truth, this light that brings salvation. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. It shines brighter and brighter until full day. Well, that will happen if we continue to shine that light we continue to reflect it. If we change and become wicked, what, what happens? The darkness comes back. David wrote in Psalms 119 verses 17 and 18, Deal bountifully with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. We hear the word law, and I don't know about you, but almost immediately I have a negative connotation in my mind. It's like law, oh yeah, I don't want to, yeah, I got I to gotta obey the law, right? That's the natural man. But here we can see what David is saying is, no, open my eyes that I can behold wondrous things out of your law. And a righteous law brings light and truth. It's good for everyone. It brings justice and clarity. David says, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Ultimately, that's our purpose, to bring this light in so that we can save ourselves, so that we can live. But we have to do this by keeping God's word. This is right on with bring that truth into your heart and act on it and live it. David understood this, and he looked at the law with these set of eyes. The law is good for me. It's not evil. It brings these things that are godly, that are light, that are hopeful. In Acts 28, 25 through 27, and disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet. The setting here is, there's a big, big argument here with the leaders of, the, of Israel. Go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. Did they hear the good news? Did they hear the gospel? Yes. Did they see, many of them, Christ, the anointed? Yes. Verse 27, for this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. The church age was coming. It was in the process of starting. The early church was made up of Jesus' brethren, the Jews, but the message was the same. If they were going to hang on to that old law, and they were going to hang on to those things, and not recognize who Christ was, they wouldn't be healed. They needed to acknowledge that truth and come to that light. Ephesians 1, 17 through 19. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you. What are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His great might? God has set this plan up. We call it the plan of the ages. It's an, a way for mankind to find their way through the darkness, through the confusion, and to come to their senses to come to the reality of God's intention to bring truth and light to this whole world. But it takes belief. It takes 
us to say, I believe in that. That can be difficult when all of the world is saying, that's ridiculous, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard. And we do hear that. And maybe they don't say it directly, but indirectly when they're saying other things that aren't true, that's kind of where this goes. And it's incumbent on each of us to, in meekness and gentleness, be able to say, wait a minute, what does the scripture say? What is the truth? What is the light that was given? Remember, Satan can come as an angel of light. And we know that a lot of the things that are being talked about have been pro propagated by him and encouraged by him. We have to stay aware and to keep our eye on that prize. Thank you. Let's have a song. Conclude with number 69. Go and inquire. Song number 69. Father, for the time that we have to come together in peace and safety, to look at your words, to understand them, to apply them in our lives, to bring your light into our heart, that truth, so we can express it and share it with others. Continue to guide us from day to day. Help us to remember all those that have come before us. We're grateful for the times that we've had to always have to be together in this uh, time. Be with the brethren wherever they are gathered in your name. Continue to guide us until your son's return. May that day come soon. In Jesus' name.